Today's presentation is called the Model Youth Club, Building a Club Based on Best Practices. This is a presentation that I delivered two weeks ago at the NSCAA convention. Um, it is based on real examples of best practice. Um, and you can see from the logos on your screen, there are 10 organizations, each one of them contributing one example to the best practices. And we've done many surveys over the past two years for the NSCAA, and many, many more before that over the last six years. And these are just 10 examples. Um, I believe we have somewhere close to 35 examples of best practice, and over 45 to 50 examples of good practice, and I'll make um, reference to the distinction between the two in some, um, some time from now. <clears throat> this is not a presentation specifically about the Club Standards Project, but if you'd like to stay on about 10 minutes, uh, for about 10 minutes after the questions and answer session, then I will certainly go through with you uh, some examples of uh, the intermediate and advanced assessments and also give you some ideas of the process and the cost of participation. So that will be at the end of the presentation, five, ten minutes at the end. So I'd like to try and, at this point, go to our first poll question. Um, and this will appear on your screen um, in a second. Um, here it comes. And it will give me an idea of um, the type of individuals and particularly the type of clubs that you represent. So. I'd like you to answer this question, what type of club do you represent? And if you click on one of the answers on the screen, and I'll give you somewhere close to about five seconds more to answer it, and then we'll close it up and we'll share um, the results. So uh, a couple more seconds. OK. All right. That's, that's pretty good. 83% of you voted. And um, as you can see now on your screen, here come the results of that uh, question. So about 40% of you are representing recreation, competitive, and premier clubs. So pretty much a full service organization. Uh, very few of you are involved just in recreation. Um, and uh, some of you are involved at the competitive premier level, probably involved with professional clubs. So uh, that gives me a good idea. And when we go through these examples, you'll see the 10 organizations that we list. I'll give you a bit more specific information about them, and you can determine whether they're um, like you or not. So um, <clears throat> before we um, go too much further, um, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss and uh, share with you a little bit of our research about what a successful club looks like. On the screen, there are seven um, uh, variables, seven features of successful clubs. Um, the clubs that we've evaluated to date are approximately 120, um, just north of 120 youth clubs over the last six years. Those clubs are ranging in size from uh, as small as 200 player programs with 15 coaches, all the way up to 5,000 plus players and 500 plus coaches. Some organizations are for-profit and some organizations are non-for-profit. Um, some organizations have 100% volunteerism, others have 100% professionalism, and then there's those clubs uh, the majority of clubs, which are a hybrid between professional and volunteers. There are certainly consistencies um, in our research findings, um, which help us to provide some type of clarity in terms of what a successful club looks like. And here you can see um, retaining players, retaining coaches, um, managing growth, um, performing consistently with the aims and objectives in mind, are very important factors of, of successful clubs. Um, achieving financial viability, I'm going to talk a little bit more and give you an example of that. Um, and um, on the whole, um, are engaged and on track with the members' expectation. So um, when I was putting this presentation together, um, I wanted to um, look at it from the perspective of, you know, if I was starting a club tomorrow, would I be able to build a club based on best practices? And I think the simple answer is yes. 
Um, but one of the critical things about developing a club, whether it's an existing club or a new club, is it must have the right balance of talented individuals with um, well-designed processes and systems. Um, <clears throat> And the NSCAA Club Standards Project, our consultants, are not individuals that create best practice, but we are the purveyors of best practice. So we come into an organization, we go through a significant amount of research, and then we identify when best practices and good practices exist. In our research, we have never found two clubs exactly the same, because the interaction of multiple variables will determine how that organization performs. Um, uh, and one example will be that if we are looking at implementing an in-house coaching education program, we need to start considering things like the commitment and experience of the coaches, their levels of qualifications and awards, whether they're part-time, whether they're full-time, uh, the seasonality of the organization, is it a full year-round program or is it based on just one season or another, um, whether there are any league requirements, competition requirements for coaches to have certain levels of experience and qualifications before coaching, um, whether or not the league association is actually doing anything to support coach development, um, what the facilities are, whether you have facilities to better go indoors and do coaching education um, through the winter months or if that's not necessary, you know, do you have the outdoor facilities to run year-round programming? And whether the organization has the ability to invest in the development of their coaches um, and obviously their player development. So these factors all go in to determine uh, whether or not an in-house coaching education program is going to be successful and what format it's going to be in. Um, so this is an individual assessment process. And when you look at what we do on an assessment level at the intermediate and advanced it's all about identifying the factors that will help the individual club and that makes every assessment we do very different so let's go to another poll question and um, I would like to before I get to the slide that I pre-prepared I'd like you to answer this question on the screen about uh, what components or factors would you expect to see in a model club and you can on this question answer multiple so it's not just uh, limited to one so um, would it be the sophistication of player development framework coaching education programming um, some involvement of professional coaches and I emphasize some um, if we were to say all professional coaches I think that would reduce the number of people answering that one um, whether or not professional administrators would be something that you'd expect to see and the financial strength um, of the organization, and in particular, the ability to invest in things like player development and coaching. So let me close that poll now. And again, I'm going to share with you um, the results. Um, and as you can see on the screen, we have a lot of people that believe that a model club would have a coaching education program and a player development framework. Very, very important, of course. Now. 95% um, of clubs that we've assessed do not have a sophisticated player development framework or a coaching education, uh, in-house coaching education program. So if we expect to see it, uh, and many clubs aren't actually doing it, then there's now um, room for improvement in most organizations. Um, certainly, um, professional coaches uh, seem to be an important part of successful clubs and their influence, not necessarily that they do all the coaching, but certainly that they have um, <clears throat> some involvement in the decision-making process. And uh, one of the factors of successful clubs is financial strength. Without financial strength, it's difficult uh, to perceive or see clubs being able to move forward at any great pace. So um, here are some of the factors that I've identified, and there's eight items on my list on two slides. Uh, when we did this session two weeks ago at the convention, we had 15 items identified by the participants in that room. We had probably close to 350, 400 people in the room, many of whom I believe are joining us again tonight. Um, <clears throat> we have um, 
found that no one club so far has um, more than 50% of these eight um, examples that we would include in the model club. So um, even the successful ones that we've evaluated, I would say, would uh, only score highly on no more than four of these aspects. So let me turn over to the second sheet. And st st financial stability, as I mentioned, very important. Um, you know, one of the <coughs> critical things, if you look at um, clubs, um, particularly at the competitive level, is having healthy participation numbers, particularly at the younger levels, that help to sustain teams as the club develops. Um, in the area that I live in, in New England, uh, we are very parochial in our outlook, in our approach, uh, unlike many other aspects and areas of the country. And so as a result, we find it very difficult to sustain competitive teams in many towns um, as the players uh, get older. And that's because our clubs often are three, four, five hundred children deep. Whereas you go to the Midwest, you go out to the West, and many of those clubs are much bigger. So um, just to remind you, if you have any questions, please send those in. And uh, don't hesitate to send any question in. I don't know if we get to them all, but certainly I'll answer as many as I can. So um, best practices. The um, difference between best and good um, is that uh, the best practices are more transferable to other organizations. Good practice um, certainly is worth mentioning and highlighting, but may not be as transferable as best practice. It might be because of more local factors are taking effect, um, such as climate and geography and, and factors such as that. So let's get on to some examples. Um, as you can see, the first example, Saratoga Wilson Soccer Club in New York. On the left-hand side, you see the logo. And next to that is the date that the club was founded, um, the type of club, whether that be a recreation, competitive, or league club, the number of players, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, and how the coaching team is made up. In this case, it's a, pro a professional volunteer hybrid team. Um, their, their example of best practice is, because, uh, is, uh, is related to the implementation of an education framework. I, I truly have not seen a better example of a written approach to player development than the Saratoga Wilton um, uh, manual. Now, with that said, one of the biggest challenges that that organization has is taking what's on paper and putting it into practice on the field. There is certainly a clear appreciation that development occurs on a continuum. It's a process uh, where children's age isn't such a as big a factor as the developmental um, maturity of the individual player, and that players will um, ebb and flow along that continuum. There is mention in their manual about the importance of technical development and creativity. And not only does it say that these are important factors, but it also indicates how you achieve some of these um, goals and outcomes. Um, it also mentions, which is relatively rare, um, a playing style, how the organization um, from top to bottom would like to approach playing the game. And there's a philosophy written in there. So that's Saratoga Wilkinson Soccer Club in New York. The second example is from the Michigan Fire Juniors. Uh, Michigan Fire Juniors um, is a relatively new uh, Chicago Fire franchise in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, they were a recipient of an advanced assessment. In fact, I'm still in the process of finalizing their report. So it's a relatively new assessment program. Um, they have a fabulous approach to technical development, understanding how difficult it is for team training to dedicate a ma major amount of time to technical development of players. The club has added on an additional hour session prior to um, the team training environment um, that occurs um, before the team coaches arrive. So they hire professional staff. They make it open registration. Um, at the moment, it's two nights a week. But I understand in the spring, they're going to go to five nights a week. And children can arrive um, any time around 4 o'clock onwards and get time on the ball, um, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one duels, uh, lots of curva-type activities. They're big proponents of curva. 
and they spend as much time as they can developing these children and the results have been tremendous according to the coaches. It certainly allows the team coaches not to spend as much time on technical development, although of course it's still important for them to do so. Um, the challenge for the club at the moment is that the technical training times are not at the best times for all the parents, particularly as this has now become a destination club where children are traveling in from many miles and for some time and distance to travel. So they can't all be there for 4 o'clock and that's one of the challenges they're facing and one that they're looking to overcome. So uh, let's have a poll question now on this very topic. Um, I'm going to ask you um, whether you do anything in regards to technical training. So the question is, does your organization offer technical training sessions to supplement team training in the way described uh, by me? And that is uh, yes, somewhat, or no. So let's give you uh, five seconds or so to answer that. And with about 85% of you um, still uh, voting, that's excellent. Uh, I don't know what's happening with the rest of you, but uh, those 15%, I know who they are. I'll be calling on those people uh, very soon. So um, if you look at the results now, um, and this is uh, not, um, not unsurprising, um, only about 37% of the people on the um, webinar tonight are actually doing this type of technical training. And um, I've highlighted this as best practice because this is, in my experience, somewhat unique. Having done over 100 of these assessments myself, this is the first organization that I've seen dedicate time for technical training and add as a supplement to other training. So uh, well done, Michigan Fire uh, Juniors. Now, um, when I go through these examples of best practice, please bear in mind these aren't perfect clubs. They certainly have their challenges as do all clubs, and um, you know they would readily admit they've got their own challenges as well. Um, let's go on to the next one, number three, South Central Soccer Academy in Central Grove, India, Indiana, very close to Indianapolis. Um, I've never seen a better example of the club engaging parents and children in a more holistic experience. Most clubs will put down on paper that they are looking to develop the child, the whole child, um, leadership skills, for example, um, developing self-confidence. But this is a club that really has taken that um, verbiage and then made it a reality. Um, there's one dynamic individual, his name is Mark, um, and he has created what he calls his dream team. Um, and his dream team is made up of several parents that have bought into his dreams and they are responsible for making Mark's dreams come true. So examples include a movie night, they have a social event um, in the spring season, they uh, project up onto the um, kickback wall, um, a big movie, they bring speakers, all the families come out, they put their blankets down, they get popcorn and they have a really nice family social event. Um, another one more educationally uh, focused is make your own ball night. It actually coincided when I was on the site visit. And uh, with that, um, Mark has done his research and is trying to share with the children that they are very fortunate to have many things, including the opportunity to use a proper soccer ball. And he goes into great depth about children outside of the United States predominantly, where they have to actually make their own ball if they're going to play the game. And so on this one night, um, all the children in the academy program bring a ball that is made up of all sorts of different materials around the house. Some just use duct tape and others are a little bit more adventurous. And they bring that ball to the event um, in the evening and they play for an hour, a couple of hours with these balls that they've made and they have just a wonderful time. And uh, they also go through some educational moments with um, Mark and his team. Now, um, one of the challenges in this organization, and certainly they're doing a great, work, a great job to engage the community, but one issue they have in this area is the advent of huge church leagues built around these massive complexes with the church and fields, 
and now they have to be even more engaged with their community because they're finding at the grassroots level that uh, parents have taken their children to the churches for soccer and although the instruction isn't very good it's all about building on common values so uh, they got their challenges there um, Des Moines Menace, an organization um, in Iowa, um, one of two organizations that I've um, evaluated recently, um, they are somewhat unique because they have a benefactor who supports the program, um, a big um, or, uh, gas um, station chain. Um, so he funds quite a bit of these programming, and one way for them to um, utilize some of these funds is to create outreach programs into disadvantaged areas and also into areas where there are recreation programming but not much above that. So instead of creating an adversary, um, uh, adversary with um, adversity, sorry, with the uh, local programs, the Des Moines Menace approach is to partner with them to locate a professional member of staff in that club and provide a significant amount of coaching education. And in doing so, um, they are able to support not only the coaches, but also the players. The improvement in um, player development is dramatic. And the only um, stipulation is that they have the opportunity to start up an academy program where they can identify some of the stronger players and give them supplemental training. So that's the Des Moines Menace and their affiliate program. And now I'm going through these relatively quickly. Um, certainly, if you're interested in learning more specifics about individual clubs, then uh, I'm sure they'll love to hear from you. And if you'd like to get their contact information, you can certainly go online, or you can contact me and let me know what club you'd like to be connected with, and I'll, I'll make that connection for you. Uh, Dexter Soccer Club in Ann Arbor area, Michigan, very small organization. Um, at the travel level, a couple of hundred players. A fully um, professional coach, though, um, so the club is investing a significant amount of money in player and coach development, and uh, they are an organisation that struggles to put um, two teams out per age group in the competitive, but their teams are strong. One reason why is that they've taken a really dynamic approach to develop the players and include some innovative ways of. Uh, maximizing their resources. One such way is creating the idea of priority and non-priority teams, where a child will be um, is able to um, red roster with one team as their priority team, but then also play as a guest player on a team or as a guest training player on another team. And that's how they overcome some of their issues of not able to field more than one team. Another example is that they use pool training or centralized training locations and do combined practices. So the players in an age group, and it could be boys and girls, might train together. They get experience of all the coaches working with those age groups, but they also get the opportunity to taste what it would be like to be on the team that is above them and also below them. And similarly, they invite some of the players to move up an age group just to train and get that experience, and that's a bit of a reward through that program. So let's uh, let's go to a poll question on this particular topic. Um, this is um, relating to priority and non-priority. So if I've explained it reasonably well, hopefully you can answer this question. Um, <coughs> uh, priority team being the uh, main focus of their training, and non-priority team being their secondary uh, focus. Okay, and we'll close this poll and share now with the results. So uh, it seems like this is a relatively new idea for some of the clubs here, maybe one that you're interested in picking up, and contact the guys at Dexter, and um, I'm sure they'll be happy to share with you how they approach it. Um, this next organization is an organization that went through an intermediate assessment at Northern Lights Soccer Club in Anoka, Minnesota. Um, and this is a really good example, not only of best practice for the club, but also for the state association. Um, this is a junior coach program, what I call a junior coach program, where they're encouraging young coaches to get involved 
in the game as coaches. These may be current high school players or college players or, uh, or people that haven't played at college or high school but just are interested in becoming coach. Um, the club receives a grant from the state and they now currently have 22 players going through this program. They are required to take formal education in the form of a youth module and they also encourage to go on other programs um, paid for by the club and the state. Um, the coaches start at the youngest age groups and at the lower level, so in the recreation program, they develop confidence, they receive mentorship, and eventually they move up into becoming trainers and then eventually head coaches in the competitive program. And I believe they have now their first cohort of those coaches that have been with them now for over two years and they're now moving into head coaching positions. There's many benefits of this. Uh, one is that uh, young um, players are probably looking to earn a few dollars and if they can do so coaching as opposed to refereeing or working in the corner shop, they'll probably be more likely to want to do that. Um, other benefits for the club include eventually being able to create your own coaching pool of homegrown talent, people that are bought into the club's philosophy and in the long run probably doesn't cost you as much as bringing in the coaches from outside of the club. So let's find out how many of you are running a similar type of program as the junior coach program. This will be an interesting one to see. Um, and as you are answering this question, um, one of the things uh, that I must mention is that the NSCAA in 2014 will be launching our own junior coach initiative that will be supported by the NSCAA and we will be looking around the country for host organizations. So more information will be shared as um, it becomes available. It was a session that I delivered at the NSCA convention a couple of weeks ago. And uh, if you're interested in becoming a host organization, uh, certainly drop me a line and I can send you information when it becomes available. OK, so um, here we go. Uh, we have um, uh, about uh, well, 60% of organizations have no junior coaches, and certainly organizations that are struggling for volunteerism, um, this would definitely be one area that I would propose focusing on. Um, certainly for those of you who've got some junior coaches involved, if it's not a formal program, um, it's a good idea to try and formalize it. Um, uh, hats off, and uh, to those 4% that have got 6 to 10 junior coaches involved, and the few that have got even more than that. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, it sounds like you've done a good job for your junior coaches. Okay, let's, uh, let's press on. Um, seven is the neighborhood model. This is one that I've seen many times, particularly in the Midwest states. I'm not a great fan of the model for a number of reasons. One is the consistency in developing player development. Another one being one of liability and the ability for you to keep control and oversight of every um, uh, outside site. But at the same extent, here's one very good example how the neighborhood model has really helped an organization. You can see 3,200 players, and many of those are playing at um, schools, community centers, churches around the St. Charles area in Illinois. So this is really a good program for the club because it um, is where not only the recreation program is formed, but many of the competitive teams. And they've been doing it for over 35 years, and it's become a barrier to entry for other clubs that is looking, looking to establish themselves because they have their tentacles out into the whole community. Um, it has, it's also a great opportunity for the club to expand some of its um, uh, stronger offerings, such as the academy program, into some of the communities um, that it currently um, serves. Uh, at the moment, the academy is more of a centralized academy, and this, I believe, gives them the opportunity to get the academy out into um, some of the far out areas of the club's reach. Certainly, the challenges are being able to create consistency, um, offering oversight to all the coaches, and um, although the club assures me they're doing everything they possibly can to avoid liability, there's always the chance of liability when you've got a relatively unsupervised coaching. So 
So those are some of the challenges. But Tri-City is doing a great job on that one. Um, coach mentoring. Uh, uh, Arsenal Colorado in Fort Collins. Now we're talking about another big club um, just uh, outside of the Denver area, north of Denver. Um, the, uh, the club has um, quite a few, over 20 professional coaches in the club. So it's a big club, good reputation at the competitive level. Um, and one of the strengths of the club is that the DOC has established a coach mentoring and assessment model. The idea is um, that the, the DOC over the course of a year will find uh, three opportunities to work with and assess the professional coaching staff and those sessions, uh, one of which are coached by the DOC and the other are sessions coached by uh, the protege with the oversight of the mentor. Um, now this doesn't happen very often in my experience where a DOC who has all the knowledge, all the experience has the opportunity to pass that on to their staff. And that is, uh, of course, one of the reasons, um, such as the fact that it costs quite a bit of money to fund someone just to go around and work with your coaches. But you know, those clubs that um, are developing on this model are those ones that are more likely to be successful because they're able to create consistency from one coach to the next and hopefully improve those coaches. Um, we can't rely alone on them going out and doing coaching awards. So well done to Arsenal Colorado. And we're going to actually take a poll question, I believe the last one, um, although uh, we're not going to do that. Um, unfortunately, my poll question is gone. But I was going to ask um, how many organizations actually had the benefit of a DOC that doesn't coach. But maybe that's a whole new session uh, onto its own. OK, last couple of slides coming up. Um, Vision Soccer Academy, um, in again, in Iowa. Um, this is a, an organization that's built in an area called Waukee, which is one of the fastest growing towns in the United States. So there's a huge opportunity for the club to grow and develop. And one of the initiatives that occurred after the assessment visit was the idea of partnering with school districts. And what has happened is that the soccer club is now um, sending out their coaching staff to teach soccer units within the school curriculum. So this way, all the children in the area, um, in total 10 elementary schools, are receiving content contact with a coach from the Vision Soccer Academy. Fabulous, fabulous branding opportunity, fabulous talent identification opportunity, and when it comes to partnerships, and uh, sending out things like leaflets through the school system. Um, they're developing a complex together. This is really just a tremendous um, initiative set up after the assessment. So um, although certainly when we did this assessment, we alluded to these type of things, we weren't specific in saying this was a way to go. So really well done to those guys at the Vision Soccer Academy in Walking. Um, last example, this is for Penn Legacy in Pennsylvania, um, very close to where we were just a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and for those of you uh, who were there, Seamus stood up and talked a little bit about this program. And I know I'm not going to do it uh, justice in the way he did. But um, this is a program that really came um, out of um, a bit of um, philanthropic endeavor, but also a little bit of market forces. And um, in, in short, um, the club has found a way to offer um, an experience for young players to pay, play for no cost. And the way they've approached it is to um, offer, at the time of registration, the opportunity for a parent to decide on how much they want to pay for soccer. Uh, it is suggested that the parent pays the $75, which was the default amount, the amount that they paid prior to this new program, but they can pay as little as zero or as much as they like. Now, one of the things that's happened is that their registration revenue is down. It's down from $75 per player um, up to, uh, to uh, now $35 a player. So it's gone down $40 on average per player. Now, we give or take a few scholarships here or there. Now, of course, they don't have to do scholarships anymore. And 
as a result, they've managed to get more of the community business groups involved in sponsorships and donations. So as their um, registration revenue goes down, their sponsorship and donations are up. Uh, and although that doesn't equate back to exactly the amount, certainly they're working towards it. They have a massive tournament that they use, of course, in some way to subsidize it as well. So they've taken some revenue from another source and they've applied it to make this program work. And um, this is a tremendous example of how a club can provide a really good quality educational experience for little or no um, money. And now, kids that weren't able to afford to play, or the parents were too embarrassed to ask for scholarships, are now able to play. Um, no one's saying or telling anyone how much each person is playing. And some situations where only one child could play because it was their turn, um, and their siblings had to sit on the sideline, and then it's their turn next season, now all of the siblings in a family can play. So again, Tremendous um, example from Penn Legacy in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So um, as a way of conclusion before we get to the questions and then um, my little bit at the end for those interested in learning more about the club standards process, um, one of the, some of the keys to employing the best practices, um, you need to go through some kind of an assessment process, a feasibility study. Um, ideally, um, that would of course be with the NSCAA as a third party giving you an impartial opinion on how the organization is performing and liken that to best practices examples as we've given here today. Um, it's important that members are supportive of the changes. Um, that's always a challenge in clubs, some more than others, is getting the members and even the board members behind um, proposed changes and development. So if you've got the right environment with the support, you can make things happen pretty quickly. Um, you have to bear in mind that you might change one aspect of performance and that might have a positive or negative effect on the other. So it has to be considered about what one change can have on others. Um, and then, of course, um, you need to consider what are the resource implications in terms of staffing, in terms of um, the cost, what impact is that going to have on volunteerism, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the kind of things that we take into consideration when we've given clubs advice and guidance. So one thing that all of these clubs have in common, I've said that uh, no two clubs are the same, but one thing they all have in common is that they have benefited by learning about what is the best standards in the industry. And each one of them has contributed to best practice so that the next organization in the line will benefit from that experience. So. Um, this is uh, not live. Uh, this is uh, me on a better day. And uh, just want to, before I get to questions, let me tell you what the next 12 months is going to look like for club standards and uh, a little bit of um, uh, education. Firstly, we're going to launch the junior coach program. Um, keep your eyes and ears open for that if you're interested. Secondly, um, those clubs participating in the club standards project at the preliminary, intermediate, or advanced level, we're going to start creating yearly events. There'll probably be one yearly event for clubs participating at all three levels, and there may be a biannual or quarterly online forum exclusively for those at the intermediate and advanced level assessments where they'll be able to exchange examples of best practices. So to participate in that, you're going to have to do one level of assessment. Um, the e-learning courses, um, we're going to move more of this type of content, webinars, um, into an e-learning platform and give people not only to do it live but also on demand. And then um, also we're going to be creating more club standards education tracks for youth clubs in the next conventions over the summer and also um, in the 2015 um, uh, convention. So, um, I have no idea what time it is. I apologize if I've run over. Let's go to a few of your questions at this point. If you haven't already sent some in, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, at this time, I'll take them, and we will do our best to answer certainly a few of them. So give me a second here while I read one or two of them. Um, Diallery <coughs> um, um, asks about any examples um, of youth referee programs within clubs. 
Um, good question. I, I have seen some examples of um, uh, referee programs. Uh, for example, Nana Wisconsin was a club where they had a very good referee program. Um, they actually made a mistake of cutting back on the budget for the referee program, and they lost a few of their young referees. But they brought that back, and they uh, have done a really good job of training young referees under the guidance of mentors. So that was a really um, good, um, re really good example. Um, so John asks, um, why do most clubs fail? Well, John, um, I don't know if we've got the time to go into everything at this point, but um, I can give you a few ideas. I don't, I don't think fail is the um, correct term. I do believe that a lot of clubs um, struggle to um, understand what they need to do in order to improve the environment. Bearing in mind that many people involved in clubs just don't come from a professional education youth sports background. And so when they make decisions, they're making decisions probably based on previous experiences from the regime that was there before. So going into um, examples like you've seen here today, um, you know, many of those examples I didn't know before I went out and assessed them. But one of the things I do do is I go back and bring as many of these good examples back to the club that I run. And I think that's really important um, to remember that you know, not every example of best practice, good practice is going to be um, uh, applicable, but there's going to be enough out there that's going to really make a big difference. So um, I don't think um, clubs are necessarily failing. I just don't think that they're performing um, at a particularly high level. Um, OK, so uh, Katie, um, and I'm just going randomly through the list here. I'm sorry if I miss you. Um, how can you apply to have your club assessed? Well, Katie, if you stay on for a few minutes at the end here, I'll go through that process and we'll go through and explain how that works. And my colleague, Danielle, will probably join me and have a few words of wisdom as well. Um, Emily asks, um, do you believe that younger coaches need to be more of the focus when it comes to building foundation for a smaller or newer club? Um, Emily, I believe the focus of developing a coaching uh, pool, um, talent pool, has to be at the younger levels um, for any type of club, whether you be um, a small club or a large club, whether you be at the recreation level or the competitive level. Um, the, the, there's certainly um, been a big movement over the last five years or so with more coaches turning to the profession and more clubs looking for professional coaches. So as the pool grows of talent, so does the number of clubs demanding professional coaches. And one way to satisfy, particularly with the younger players, you, know, you don't need A licenses um, to, uh, to um, work with uh, four and five-year-olds, um, but you need people with um, enthusiasm and uh, hopefully some demonstration skills so they're perfect for them. And it's our investment in the young people to help them develop into better coaches. So um, that's, uh, that's how I would uh, approach that. Uh, let's take one more, and then I will do my best over the course of the next couple of days to answer everyone's question on our LinkedIn forum, and I will send everyone a link to that. Um, let me just see if I can take one more. Um, okay, uh, from Matthew, he asks, how would you go about educating a mainly volunteer coaching staff? Well, Matthew, when we look at most assessments, we're looking at organizations that have volunteers in coaching. And what I'm always interested to see is that most um, of these clubs will, um, will give the responsibility for coaching education to the state association or the NSCAA, but do very little in-house. Um, my experience has been the more you invest time and energy and money in your coaches internally, the more likely you're going to find that these coaches will be engaged and more coaches will step forward. One example um, that I have um, uh, approached in the last 12 months for my organization has been to um, bring in a coaching course, um, obviously through the NFCAA, and open that up to any parent that wishes to attend and get the level, in this case, two or three coaching award. What you find is you, a lot more parents will step forward, and uh, that aren't coaches but as a result of participating in the course, you find that many more of them will want to participate in coaching as a result of their newfound belief 
and confidence. So, okay, well, thank you very much. I, I have no idea how many um, questions we have, but I know I've got a slate full that I have to answer over the course of the next few days. So, um, for those of you who now need to leave, please uh, thank you for your participation. I will spend five minutes there or thereabouts going through the steps to join the Club Standards Project. And um, I don't know if Danielle is with us. Um, Danielle, are you there? Yes, sure, I'm here. Okay, so Danielle works with me with the Club Standards. Um, many of you will be familiar um, with uh, Danielle. And uh, so if you would like to speak to either of us um, following this, please um, don't hesitate to drop us a line. So Danielle, if I miss anything, please jump in. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, to give you an idea of the scope of the project, we have currently 1,287 clubs currently participating um, in the project at the preliminary level. If you haven't already completed the assessment, you can do so by going on to nscaa.com forward slash club standards. So that's the URL, and you can go up and it takes five minutes to complete that level. And I'm going to actually have that URL up on the next screen. We have 23 clubs that in this last 12 months have been through the intermediate, and then 15 clubs that have been through the advanced level assessment. This is just in the last 12 months. So the preliminary assessment, there's the URL I mentioned. It's 15 questions. It takes five minutes for you to complete. You get instant feedback, an email that tells you how many yes answers you made and tells you roughly how that equates to um, your performance as a club. Very rudimentary. Um, if you do go through that, your name and your email address will be then included on future um, published um, information about presentation and events, and you will get a follow-up by my colleague Danielle, who will ask you if you're interested in taking the next steps. So a good way to get into the project and understand our focus. At the intermediate level, this is where we start to add on a consultant. Now, um, the intermediate and advanced starts off the same. We have a pre-survey, 60 questions that go out. We ask you to uh, spread that around members of your club, hopefully people with the knowledge and experience to answer the questions. Um, the focus is on player and coach development um, and administration, so three areas. Um, you'll see the questions. You'll know who to send those out to. We collect artifacts that support your answers. So if you say you've got a player development curriculum, we want to see that. If you say you've got bylaws, um, you've got a coach, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, you've got a coach code of conduct, we want to see all of those kind of things. Um, you then identify two primary areas that you would like us to focus on in the recommendation section of the report. Because we have about 15 hours of available time for this, we can't be all comprehensive, so we want really two areas that you'd like us to look at in your organization. We create a load of follow-up interview questions, and then we create the strengths and weakness analysis, which are five strengths and five weaknesses in the three primary areas of focus. The final report, once you've said, yes, we have done a good job of identifying strengths and weaknesses, then we write a report somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 pages, and it includes two recommendations. The cost of that is $750. It is all done by correspondence. There's no site visits. You do get to speak to your consultant on a regular basis, and it will take somewhere in the region of four to six weeks to complete that process. It's ideal for a club that has a low budget, um, wants to narrow the focus to a couple of things, um, and may, may be an organization that can just about get enough support to go at the intermediate level. Um, on the um, flip side, um, the advanced level assessment is significantly different. Um, although we start off the same, um, this is a comprehensive assessment, nuts to bolts. So um, in addition to doing a lot of pre-work prior to a site visit, we then send a consultant who spends the best part of two days in your environment. That includes interviews with all your directors. It includes um, interviews with um, coaches, um, it, uh, visits to facilities, watching the coaches working in their coaching environment. One of the most important meetings we have are with parents, with customers. We spend two hours with them normally, 30 parents in a room sharing experiences both 
strengths and weaknesses. And then that information is then um, put into a report and shared with the club. The report is extremely comprehensive. We also get an official performance score. Um, the size of the report is um, uh, about five, six times as big as the intermediate level because it has up to 15 to 25 recommendations in it, and they're written in full. Um, the cost is obviously a lot different, $4,750 with a maximum stipend of $500 towards travel and accommodation. Um, I would say that this is more suitable for clubs that are wanting to compare their performance against the best practices in all areas, not just in one or two. Um, it is an organization that is probably going through or considering major decisions that might upgrade the performance of the club in all of those areas. Um, it is a club that is looking to make significant investment. It might be hiring someone, restructuring their staffing structure. Um, maybe it's a, a, about merging with another organization. Uh, these are all things that we will be able to dispatch an expert on these um, experiences. And then lastly, it would be perfect foundation for developing strategic planning. Um, strategic planning is so important to any youth organization, big or small, and so many, so few organizations have a strategic plan.